forward to cloud. Okay, so <laughs> now our discussion won't make it, you know, our little chat won't make it to the, the YouTube channel, which, you know, I'm assuming wouldn't be a problem, but you never know. Okay, so um, so number one says a piezometer and a pitot tube. So this is like, this one's almost like uh, vocabulary words. A piezometer and a pitot tube are tapped into a four centimeter diameter horizontal water pipe. So let's see, let's not use red, let's use black. So it's horizontal. And then, um, oh no, it's not gonna work like that, okay. So basically what they do is they tap into it, two holes into this four inch pipe. Um, I would never give you this problem because it, 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 I don't know, I think people, too many of my students wouldn't know what a piezometer is, what a pitot tube is, um, but they're tapped into a four centimeter diameter uh, horizontal water pipe and the height of the water columns are measured to be 26 centimeters in the piezometer and 34 centimeters in the pitot tube. So this one's going up like this and this one's also going up like this, but this one's special. So this one's like this. Okay, and this pipe just kind of keeps going. So let me do this. Okay, so um, a, a quick note on like just drawing. This means the pipe keeps going indefinitely in this direction. I just obviously you can't draw the entire pipe if it goes on forever. Um, this means it's open to whatever is on the other side of it. Okay, so that's why I, I paused and made sure to, to draw that correctly. Otherwise, I have people confuse, you know, my drawings on a test and then, you know, so I need to make sure that I'm consistent. And that's consistent with most textbooks. Okay, so um, we've got 26 centimeters in the pitot tube, and, excuse me, 34 in the pitot tube. So 34 is, this thing is going up 34 inches. And this one's going to go up 26 inches. So we'll just draw that in blue. So here's the water surface. So this is 26 centimeters. This is 34 centimeters. <clears throat> determine the velocity in the pipe. So um, this is actually, a, um, oh, excuse me, determine the velocity at the center of the pipe. So this is a standard um, sort of, I don't know actually if they use these anymore. I'm sure they use this principle. But the idea here is what we're looking at is the difference between these two pipes and what they're measuring in the water. and um, so we're using, I, I don't know. So normally what they do actually is they have a, it's called a, um, I think it's called a pitot static tube and it's a combined piezometer and pitot tube. So this one's the pitot and this one's the, the piezometer. And basically the piezometer only registers the, um, the, the pressure in the tube and the pitot tube measures the pressure and the velocity. So really the difference between these two is the pressure. Okay, and so um, like I can look at this right now and I, well, I can't mathematically figure out what the, what the answer is, but I already know how this is gonna solve. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna imagine basically a streamline of the fluid. So the fluid is just cruising along this pipe and it's all kind of going parallel to the pipe. This is kind of an assumption, you know? And what we're gonna imagine is we're gonna imagine this special streamline right here. I'll do this, this particular streamline in blue that stagnates right at the, at the end of this, at the end of this pitot tube. And so what happens is, and I mean, I talk about this in the, in the lectures, but what happens is as this thing approaches that pitot tube, so we can imagine that, you know, all along that line, the water is moving. However, right at that point, it has to stop. And the reason we know that it has to stop is because the water is not flowing inside this tube, or otherwise it would be, it wouldn't be 34 inches. It would be 34 inches and growing. Um, and so, What's happening is as the, the water goes from some distance away from it, we'll call it right here, um, as it starts there and as it approaches that, that location, it basically slows down. And a lot of that velocity as it slows down is being converted into pressure. Okay, and that's why the water, the height of the water in the pitot tube is higher. So what we do here is, um, excuse me, we consider this, um, distance right here. So this will be our first point that we're going to think about. And we're thinking about this second point right here. And what we're doing here is that this first point, and, and this should make some sense, is that the higher the water, this water is driven up here, 
that is just the pressure in the flow. So from point one, we just have the pressure in the flow. From point two, we actually have the pressure at point two is what's driving it all the way up here. But the pressure at point two is really an expression of the velocity at point one and then whatever the pressure is in the flow. Okay, so, um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So the way we do this is we, we're gonna do a Bernoulli equation and I'm gonna say that between one and two, okay, uh, between one and two. Okay, we need to think about, um, okay, so we need to know, you know, can we use Bernoulli? Okay, and because this is a, you know, this is the Bernoulli problem set. So clearly we're going to use Bernoulli, but we want to think about what this is. And so there are some assumptions. So the first one is, is the flow steady? And they haven't told us anything to make us think that this flow is not steady. So if the flow is not steady, they have to say like, you know, it's, you know, the, the height of the water in the, in the piezometer is 26 centimeters and dropping, or they have to tell you something's changing and they haven't said anything's changing. So we're going to go with, okay, you know, that's an assumption. We're going to assume that. Um, we want to know is, is the fluid incompressible? And we have to look at the problem. Did this say it's water? It says it's water. So water is, for all intents and purposes, incompressible. Obviously, you can compress anything, but outside of very extreme circumstances, you know, we'll consider water to be incompressible. Um, and then we want to know um, basically, is there energy, any energy gain or loss? between points one and point two. And so basically, usually, usually what we're asking there is really, is there any friction? Okay, any head loss is what, what, they'll, what they'll call it. And uh, in this case, there's no reason to think, I mean, there, in reality, there always is friction and we will learn how to deal with that, um, which is one of the things I like most about this class is that we finally get to realistically deal with friction. Unlike, you know, other classes where uh, it's always a frictionless pulley, it's always a, you know, no wind resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And we're actually gonna deal with that. But right now we're just gonna assume, we're again, this is, these are all assumptions that we're making. Um, none of these are, you know, really, well, I mean, the steady is definitely, it's definitely steady. It's definitely in incompressible, at least for this problem. But, you know, these are all just kind of like, we're making assumptions so that we can use this equation. Um, okay, so that's pretty much what we need. So we're just gonna go ahead and use the Bernoulli. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go from point one to point two. And so P1, so this is the Bernoulli equation and it sucks when you first see it um, because it's kind of a lot. So basically it says that, you know, the pressure head plus the elevation head plus the velocity head is constant. So that any two points along a, along a streamline. So one and two have to be along a streamline. It's constant, okay, so. Okay, and this is, you know, just an equation that we need to get used to. And what we're gonna do here, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna have to get used to doing this again and again and again and again, is we wanna get rid of these terms because we don't wanna, you know, this is, a, it's a lot, right? It's, it's six terms, it's annoying. So we get rid of these the same, well, depending on the problem, we get rid of different terms in different ways. So the first thing I want to note is, let's see here. Um, okay, the elevations, Z, Z1, Z2. So what we need to do is we need to go in here and we need to create a datum. And the datum is wherever we want it to be. Um, so in these problems, Z is always up and X is always to the right. Um, or I guess X would be the left if you want. But there's always Z is the vertical. And so what we want to do is we want to decide on a place where Z is zero. So the easiest place to do this is I usually like to make Z right where my points are. Okay, so then when I do that, Z1 and Z2 are both equal to zero. Okay, so I, I'll go here and I'll say, okay, Z1, that goes away because it's the datum. Z2 is also the datum. Okay, note that algebraically, it wouldn't matter where I put Z because if Z1 and Z2 are the same thing, algebraically, they'll just go away. Okay, so then the other thing we need to do is we need to look at, um, you know, it's like, okay, what about these pressures? What can I say about the pressure at one? Well, I can actually get the pressure at one. Um, and this is how I do it, is I say, okay, this is a hydrostatic situation. The fluid is not moving up here. Now, one of the things that people will ask a lot about is they'll say, what about down here where the fluid is moving? If the fluid is moving um, perpendicular 
to uh, the direction of the movement and it's not curving, then you can use the hydrostatic equation. So in other words, we can say that the pressure at one, so I'm gonna do this on the side here in black, P1, okay, I'm gonna use the, um, I'm gonna use the hydrostatic equation. So just like we were in a manometer. So we'll basically start up here and we'll say it's P atmosphere right here at the surface. And then I'm gonna move downwards through the fluid. So I'll say plus gamma the fluid, that's water in this case, times that distance. Um, and it looks like it's, unfortunately we've got like, you know, a weird distance. We've got 26 centimeters plus whatever this distance, whatever the radius of the pipe is. Actually, let me undo that. Let me get rid of that little, well, whatever. Okay, this distance right here. Okay, I'll just call that R for the radius of the pipe. Okay, we didn't really want to deal with R, but I guess it's there. So um, what's that, 26 centimeters plus R. So I'll go right here, 26 centimeters plus R. Okay, and I did a bad job taking care of my space there. And so what that means is the P atmosphere will make it zero for ga zero gauge, because we don't want to have to deal with that. So, um, so I can plug P1 back in over here, okay? But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and get P2, because we might as well do that. So here's P2. P2, okay, inside this tube, right? We don't care about going to the right. So we're gonna start at P atmosphere, P ATM. Okay, again, that's gonna go away because that's gonna be zero gauge. And then we're gonna add gamma of water times 0 0.34 plus R, 0 0.34 meters, plus whatever the radius of that pipe is. Okay, again, we'll plug that one back in over here. Okay. Now, uh, the last thing we want to do, the last thing we can do is we, we don't know anything about um, V1. We know that it's greater than V2 because V2, it's not moving. That's the stagnation point. So because V2 is not moving, we can go here and I could say V2 is zero. And I could say that because it's a stagnation point. Okay, and the last thing that I want to do, and, and this is fairly clear in this problem, but I just want to make a make a you know make note of it because this becomes something that confuses people later. Is this gamma right here? That's the gamma of the fluid that's flowing. So sometimes there'll be a manometer in the problem, and the manometer will have a different fluid. And sometimes the manometer is is a water manometer, and the fluid that's flowing is oil or something or air or you know, whatever. And uh, the important thing is to make this a W. Okay, that's the fluid that is flowing at that moment. Okay. So what we're going to do now is uh, we'll plug in. And so P1 equals gamma water 0 0.26 meters plus R. And you'll notice that, that gamma W is going to cancel. Okay, uh, V1 squared on 2G equals P2 is gamma water 0 0.34 meters plus R divided by the gamma of water. And um, let's see, so um, oh yeah, it's cool. Um, okay, so then what we can do is uh, basically we can solve this problem. Um, and what's gonna happen is algebraically these gamma waters are gonna cancel. And then I've got a plus R on both sides. So that's gonna go away. So we don't care about that. Um, and then I can subtract the 0.26 from both sides. So this thing's gonna, you know, fall apart pretty quickly to V squared on 2G equals 0 0.08 meters. Okay, and um, before we solve this, which is simply a matter of plugging in the gravity and then um, you know multiplying and taking a square root, I wanna kind of talk about what this means. Okay, because this is a really, really important um, concept here. And this is why like this version of the, of the Bernoulli equation where everything is in terms of lengths, right? This is a length, you know, the datum is, you know, some sort of meters or something. This is a length. We're measuring pressure in terms of length. We're measuring velocity in terms of length. Like we do velocity squared and divided by 2G, you've got a length. And like, what does that even mean? Like, I mean, here we are, we're sitting here and I've got V squared on 2G equals a length. Okay, or V1 squared over 2G. And so what this means is P1 over, over gamma water 
Okay, what is that length? Well, that length is right here. Okay, it is basically, you know, the length that the water will be pushed up by that pressure. So that is what we call the pressure head. Okay, P2 over gamma water, and that is this length right here. Okay, that's the pressure head at that location. Okay, and that pressure is basically um, increased by this amount right here, 0 0.08. So we went up eight centimeters. And that bit, um, maybe I'll do that in red, P squared on 2G, that's right here. Okay, so in essence, and, and this will be something that we need to solve later on, here's Z right through the middle. Here's the pressures in green. And then here's the, the, the kind of the velocity head on the top there. And so what happens is in this case, there's no energy loss. So we have the same amount of energy between these two points. So the energy here equals the energy here. Okay, it's just differently um, proportioned, right? So there's 34 centimeters of energy in each of them. Just on the left, we've got 26 centimeters of pressure and eight centimeters of velocity. And on the right, we've only got pressure. And so that's what the whole point of this pitot tube is, is that it converts between the pressure. I mean, it, yeah, excuse me, it converts the velocity into pressure. And so because of that, we can now compare the two. And so this difference between the two, this eight centimeters, which we can just like look at and read really easily. Well, now we can figure out what the velocity is by just you know, using this equation right here. And so that's the whole idea. Okay, so it's a little bit you know, roundabout, but it's like, okay, this is cool. So, so what we'll do here is, I mean, we'll go ahead and solve this. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, V1 equals the square root of two, which G is uh, 9.81 meters per second squared times 0 0.08, which of course I am like really out of room here, meters per second squared and V1 equals whatever V1 is. Um, I'm just gonna look at the key here because I don't feel like punching that in the calculator right now. Um, so um, let's see here. So, well, you know what? Let's punch in the calculator. Prefer not to trust the key. Um, let's see here. Two times 9.81 times 0 0.08 to the half power. Yeah, one and a quarter, okay? Um, 1.25 and I'm just gonna, there's not enough space right now. So I'm just gonna not bother getting the five significant digits answer. Okay, so that's the idea. Any questions, thoughts? And, and so then the, the Z is just in case like those are offset, right? Yeah. So that's, that's when that, and that cancels out the difference yep. up there from the difference on the bottom. Yep. So let's see, I'm, I'm gonna try to find one that's got a little angle on it. Um, yeah, here we go. This is like a really lovely problem. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's do number uh, six or six to eight. Um, these, are, these are wonderful. Um, I really love these. They're very, they're kind of challenging. Um, so let's, um, how do I erase all this? They're all drawings. Okay, so this one, number six, because this one, this one will allow us to get into all the different um, kind of ways that we can use this. So, I mean, we might even end up just doing this one for the rest. Um, it all depends on, you know, how much we want to talk about it. There's always like so many like points of interest that are interesting. Um, you know, that, that demonstrates something about the way fluids work. Okay, so this is going to enlarge. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, this goes over the top of the water. Okay. All right, so... Um, yeah, I, I, I love this one. Um, let's see, so this is, they've given us some points, which 
I don't like when they do that because it takes some of the thinking out, but they did. So we'll go ahead and do it. Three and here's four. Okay, and point two, it, it looks like they even told us where the datum is, which I don't like when they do that either. But, um, you know, I guess it, it does make grading a lot easier. Let's see here. Oh, this is a four. This is a, okay, so here's the datum. Let's use yellow. Now point two is two meters up. And point three is seven meters up. So point three is above the surface of the water. Let me give us a little D right here. This big D right here. Okay, water at 20 C, a siphon from a reservoir. I don't think, I don't know if the, the temperature really matters. It should matter, but they they told us, okay. Okay, D is nine point, little D is 9.7 centimeters. I have no idea why they chose that number. And big D is 16 centimeters. And then they say PV equals 2.338 times 10 cubed Pascals. Okay, absolute. All right, um, first of all, and you know, this is, this is something that shows up a lot. Let's see, what do they want to know? Let's see. Determine the maximum flow rate that can be achieved without cavitation occurring in the piping system. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, okay, so the question here is, do, can you, I mean, so, so this is going to be a bit more of a dialogue than just me just working it. Um, can you, okay, so Cavitation, what do you remember about cavitation? Most of my students won't really remember a whole heck of a lot at this point, because we don't really talk about it. Like we talk about it very briefly and then we come back. Yeah, I don't remember the definition too well. I, I, I know it has to do with like the flows and pipes and when it's at the wrong pressure or something like that. Yeah, so if the pressure drops too low, then essentially there's not enough pressure to maintain the liquid as a fluid. And so it basically becomes a gas. And um, I highly recommend actually go back to the videos that I posted to YouTube and watch just for fun. Watch the these guys shoot a gun underwater and on the sides of the bullet and the, the pressure drops so low that that the water cavitates. And so what happens is you get a gas bubble that forms behind the bullet and the gas bubble actually implodes because it's an area of really, really low pressure and it implodes. And you can actually watch it kind of it, it pulses as it implodes. It's pretty cool. Um, there's also a mantis shrimp, which um, punches so hard that it drops the pressure so low there's cavitation. You can also get online and look up um, uh, propellers, like on boats and things like that. And if they, if they cavitate, the, the bubbles, the, the low pressure areas behind the, behind the, the propeller uh, blade, basically as they, as they implode, they let out like basically a shock wave that really damages the, the propeller. So you, you'll see like, you, if you just type in cavitation damage, you'll see all kinds of things that just completely get eaten up by cavitation. So we don't want cavitation, it's really bad for our pipes. So it's like something that we often plan for. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we wanna know what is the max flow rate such that we don't get cavitation. And so what we should imagine here is that the, the pressure in this pipe everywhere, like on a, in a steady system, steady flow, the pressure everywhere is gonna be a little bit different. So what we wanna know is, first of all, where is, the, where is the pipe most likely to cavitate? Do you have any idea? I mean, obviously it's gonna be like, where, where the pressure is lowest. Do you have any idea where the pressure might be the lowest? At that change in volume, like at okay. 0.2? So, so that's, a, that's a thought because, so one of the reasons for that would be, why would you think that? That, that like there's not enough material going into it or something so there would be like a change in pressure or something okay there is a there's a massive change in pressure right there but the pressure actually increases as it goes from small to big okay and and that all comes out of Bernoulli so if we say p on gamma plus z plus uh, v squared on 2g equals a constant 
Okay, so if we ignore the height difference between as we go from here to here, then what's happening is what's the fluid doing? You think it's speeding up or slowing down as it goes from small to big? Slowing down. Right. So if it slows down, so if this term decreases, then the pressure has to increase to compensate. Okay, so that's so that's the idea here. So so actually we would never expect cavitation right here. Like never. It might happen right here. In fact, that would be a candidate spot. But, um, but that's actually not the spot that I was thinking of. Okay, um, whenever you see systems like this, there's always the, the same spot. And that is, um, you, you have another guess or do you want me to just tell you? I mean- yeah, if you just tell me, I'm not, I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Okay, so this spot right here, spot three, and the reason for that is because exactly what's going on here. So if we imagine, uh, so if we, is looking at Bernoulli again. So um, if we imagine going from say this point right here, point two, all the way up to three. Okay, the diameter of the pipe is the same the whole way. So the velocity doesn't change. So there's no change here, but we go up in Z, this goes up a lot. So the pressure goes down a lot. Okay, and so that's the key. So it's, it's really just hydrostatics, except it's not a static fluid, right? So like as you move upwards in a fluid, it tends to get less pressure. Now, if you're over here, you're never gonna cavitate because by the time you get to gauge pressure, that's where you get to like, that's where you get to atmospheric pressure and you're in the atmosphere. But if you're in a, if you're in a siphon, you can get pressures that are below atmospheric. So you can get below zero pressures. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, this is uh, the, the equilibrium vapor pressure for water at this temperature. They gave it to us, which is why it's weird that they gave us 20 C because normally if they give you 20 C, they're saying, look this number up on the table uh, because the temperature matters. Um, so instead what we're gonna do here is basically we're gonna say, well, we wanna make sure that whatever else happens, um, this pressure, at this point where it's most likely to cavitate remains at least this value. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, okay, well, let's, um, let's solve this sucker. Let's, let's go um, P3 over gamma plus Z plus V squared V3 on 2G. Okay, so I'm skipping point two, maybe. So then the question becomes, where do I want the first point to be? Because it could be point one, it could be point two, it could be point four, it could be anywhere along this whole thing that I want it to be. Okay. And what I'm going to recommend to you when you do this is you think about where do you have the most information? Okay. Because that's where we want to work. And the easiest thing always in all of these problems is if you can get to the top of a reservoir or top of a lake or a tank or whatever, that's the spot that you want. Okay, so we want this point, and I'm going to show you why when I, as we eliminate terms. Okay, the first nice thing is we always know you're able to get the, um, so let's see, this is the datum. Hold on, I'm trying to get, uh, I want to be able to view the screen here. Can you see, why is this so dumb? <laughs> um, you. Okay, good. All right, yeah. I wanna be able to see what I'm drawing. Um, okay, so, so what we do here is we're, gonna, we're just gonna go term by term. So pressure one, what's the pressure at one? You know? At atmospheric? Yep. So that's zero. Yep. So usually what I do here is I write ATM and that means it's atmospheric. And so the next one, I'm going to make it zero because I'm working in gauge. Okay. Now we'll note that there's a problem there. What's the problem with what I just said? It has something to do with this number up here. And this little, this little bit right here. Oh, cause they want us in absolute instead of gauge. Right, so we have a choice here. Either I can convert this to gauge, or I can work this whole problem over here 
in absolute. Okay, so it all has to be in the same. So it's just it's just something you got to be aware of. So um, what we'll, I think what we'll do, um, yeah, let's just let's just turn this into an absolute. Okay, two point three three eight times ten to the third pascals, and then um, to turn that into um, gauge. We're going to hold on. Let's see here. Absolute, <laughs> absolute minus atmospheric equals gauge, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to subtract out the atmospheric. So um, the atmospheric pressure is one hundred one point um, three. Oh man, how am I? How am I forgetting this? This is this is disgusting. Hold on, give me a second. <laughs> atmospheric pressure. In Pascals, 101.3 Pascal, uh, KPA. KPA. Is that right? Yeah, of course. Okay. So then we get PV equals negative. Okay, let's see here. 101.3, really 325, but whatever. Uh, minus 2.338 uh, exponent 3. Negative 200, 2,000, 2, 3, 6.7 pascals. Okay. Isn't it like 99? Because shouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah. I was isn't it kilopa the, the PV is, P or is not, is like 2.338 kilopascals, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, was, I was having one of those dog moments when there's a funny noise and you kind of stare at it. Um, what happened to my calculator? Oh, right, right. I plugged in Pascal's right. Um, 101 point, it's actually 101, 101.325 minus 2.338. Right, you're right. 98, negative 98, comma 987 Pascal's. Okay, thank you. You're right. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're comparing to. We don't want our pressure to drop below that. Okay, so now um, let's see. Do we know Z at point one? Okay, based on the datum, the Z is five, right? So we're gonna go ahead and put five meters there. Okay, and this is, um, you know, if you watch the videos, this shows up all the time. And uh, for the velocity, there's a velocity to that surface. It is in fact dropping. But what we're gonna assume here is we're gonna assume that it's dropping very, very, very slowly. And the rationale for that, I always call it like the Lake Tahoe thing, as I, as I imagine you've got, um, you know, a really big lake like Lake Tahoe. And it's like, okay, well, what happens if I, you know, if I decide to drain it with, oh, well, that didn't work. If I tried to drain it with like a water, like just a house hose, you know? So I've got water coming out here. Well, the surface of the lake is dropping, but because the surface area of the lake is so large and the opening of this is so small that like, you're not even gonna be able to see it. So basically we say the velocity of the surface is zero. Okay, so I call that the Tahoe assumption. So basically, if the ratio of the, of the surface of the diameters, if the ratio of the diameters is about 10 or bigger, then the ratio of the velocities um, is 100 or bigger. And then once you square the velocities and you compare this side to that side, it becomes 10,000 difference. So in other words, if the diameters are you know, off by an order of magnitude, you don't have to worry about the bigger one, okay? If they're all off by a factor of two, then you need to worry about it. But um, otherwise, so in this case, we're just gonna go ahead and say, this is zero and, um, and I use the assumption tank is what I call it. So what this means basically is that everywhere in this whole system, if we use the Bernoulli equation and we assume we're along a streamline and it's uh, incompressible, which this is water, so it's incompressible, and, um, and it's steady, and this is basically steady. Obviously, if we wait long enough, the tank will drop enough and we'll have a different question. But um, everywhere, the total energy can be thought of as five meters. Okay, basically, and the way to think about that is this, um, this depth right here is what's driving the flow through the rest of the problem. 
right? There's no more energy at point one. The only energy it has is potential energy due to the fact that it's deep, okay? Okay, so cool. But now we wanna to go to point three and we wanna make sure that this pressure right here, that we're always above that pressure, okay? So in order to make that happen, we have to kind of limit how much flow we have, right? So, so let's go up until that point and let's see what happens. Okay, so, well, well, we won't use this pressure. Sorry, we'll use this pressure because we wanna make sure that we are in gauge. Okay, so we'll go ahead and plug it in. We've got uh, negative 98,987 Pascals over the gamma, in this case of water, which will be uh, 9810 uh, Newtons per meter cubed. Okay, notice that's, you know, Pascal is a Newton per meter, and we've got a Newton per meter cubed on the bottom. So when you divide those, you're gonna get meters, okay? And it turns out we're gonna have negative because we have a negative pressure. It's okay to get a negative pressure. It's just, um, you know, you just can't have a negative absolute pressure. So that's, you know, kind of an important point. Um, Z3, we know, okay? We just know that from the geometry. So I'll just write like geo. So in this case, that's seven meters. Okay, and then we can say, well, how much, you know, what, what, uh, what velocity can we get here? You know, how much, how much flow can we have out and not have cavitation? You know, so let's go ahead and solve this. And this may become problematic, so we'll see. If it's problematic, then, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do with that, okay? So, um, all right, so let's see. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these in, um, in um, distance units. So negative 98,987 divided by 98,10. And right there, we already see the problem. Negative 10.090 meters. Thank you for protecting me, Rocky. Yes, I'm terrified too. Hey, shh, it's just a big fluffy pup. Come here, come here, come see. You're all right, come here. Hey, no. No, you bring him to the dog park all morning. You think that you think that'd be good, but you know. Anyway, <laughs> so you see the problem. Hopefully, you see the problem right here already. You should be able to look at this and go, "Wait a second, that's going to give me you know negative ten and seven add up to negative three, and uh, that v. Wait, um, let's see. No oh, way, we can solve this. Never mind. Um, what is the problem? Negative two. Oh yeah, this is fine. Never mind. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and solve this. So, what well, we get? Negative three point zero nine. We bring it over to the other side, and we get uh, eight point zero nine o meters equals v cubed squared on two g. So you'll notice it's very common that we end up with two g times some kind of height, and we take the square root to get velocities. Happens all the time. So V3 equals the square root of two times the gravity, which is, uh, okay, 9.81. By the way, I do know what gravity is, but I always have to think what, what system of units we're in. 8.090 meters like that. Okay, so V3 equals uh, two times 9.81 times 8.09. Okay, so what, 158? 158.73 meters per second. Okay, which is a rather impressive number. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so if we wanted to turn that into a flow rate, um, let's see here, Q. Um, well, let's erase Tahoe here. I feel like I'm missing something, like I've done something wrong here. Negative two. Yes, it seems fine. Anyway, there, I, there's, something, there's something making me think this is fishy, but anyway, Q equals V, so Q at point three equals V three A three. So Q at three equals 158.73 meters per second. And the area is pi times the diameter, which is 16, 0 0.16 meters. 
squared over four. So Q3 equals um, so times pi times 0.16 squared divided by four equals 3.1914. Meters cube per second or 3.19 cubic meters per second. Okay. Um, interesting. Huh. What have I done wrong here? Hold on, give me one second. I, <laughs> the book has done something totally different. Um, okay. Huh. Okay. Well, they seem to think um, that the most likely place for this to cavitate is at point two. Huh. So um, the reason they would say that would be because the velocity of point two would be very high. Okay, so that's another possibility. Um, so we could go to two. Um, let's see, how would we do that? <laughs> let's go to point two, okay? So if, if this is where the, the, everything was gonna happen, and this is, this is a beautiful thing about this equation. So this is not wasted time or anything. This is, so that's a possibility, I guess. Let's go ahead and see if, if what would happen at point two. I think point two is gonna be a little bit more difficult, but we shall see. Okay, the nice thing about when you do this is once you've got the, the value of the energy at one point in the problem, because there's no energy loss, because there's no friction, we can just say it's five meters everywhere. So I can just keep that left-hand side of this equation. I don't have to redo that, which is awfully nice. Okay, now we want to do it point two is we want to make sure that again, we're going to, so this is P2 on gamma plus um, Z2 plus uh, V2 squared on 2G. So now we're going to the second point. So now you say, okay, well, again, we're going to use this value right here. I forgot what was that number. So if I did P2 on gamma, it's going to be this number over gamma. So what is that negative 10.0 something, 10.06? 090. 090. Okay, meters. So that's the same. The Z here, well, that's um, what's Z here? Z is uh, two meters. And the V squared on 2G. Okay, well, that's certainly, you know, so basically we're, we're going to solve the exact same equation we just did. Okay, but in this case, I guess it'll be uh, negative 10 negative eight plus five, so it's gonna be 13.09, 13.090 B squared on two G. Okay, if we rearrange that, we get B2 equals the square root of two G of 13.09 meters. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that math. Two times 9.81 times 13.09 equals 256. So that's about 16.5, 16.026 meters per second. Oh, wait. Okay, right. So notice vast difference in velocities between these two spots. Okay, now it doesn't necessarily say, you know, I mean, it, that's under cavitation, right? Um, and it's because this point is so much lower that it can, you know, it's just, it has the pressure of the fluid above it. So we want to see what about the, the flow rate. So we'll do Q equals Q at point two equals B two A two. So if this were the velocity at point two, we would say Q two equals 16.026 meters per second. The area is pi times 0.097. 0 0.097, I'm not gonna write the meters there because there's no space, over four, Q2 equals whatever that is. 
that number times pi times 0 0.097 divided by four. Ooh, Q2 equals 1.2209 cubic meters per second, or Q2 is 1.22 cubic meters per second, CMS. Okay, so that's a much smaller number. So that's actually the, the, the limited flow rate that we could actually have. Okay, so I wanna make one thing clear just to be, just to be sure. Um, actually, let me check the book and see if that's the answer they got. But um, did, you, did you square the radius? I'm not sure that you did. The 0.097. Uh, it looks like it did not. Fair enough. Luckily that's an easy fix. Yeah, so 0.1184, is that what you're getting? Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, 0, 0.0, uh, son of a, <laughs> all right, yeah. Thank you for checking me. Okay, so what? Um, uh, 0 0.11843, 0 0.118, okay, right. Okay, notice it's a much smaller flow rate. Okay, if you wanted to, um, so note that these were two separate cases that in the case where, you know, this is the max flow rate, okay, note that this Q is the same Q throughout this whole problem. That is the Q at four, that is the Q at three, that is the Q at two, that is the Q at one. In fact, that is the Q up here. Just so happens that that Q is so small that this, this the velocity is very small because the area is very big. But we'll have, you know, the highest velocity will be in this little narrow pipe. And then as soon as it widens, we'll have the same velocity all through here. But the same amount of water that's, you know, like if I draw a control volume in here, you know, here's my control volume, whatever. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean to follow the edges of the pipe. But then whatever is entering right here, Q, is what's leaving right here. Okay, and that goes for any control volume that pretty much that I draw on this thing because um, there's no other place for the water to go. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, pretty complicated. The cool thing about this is that on any system, I could ask you a problem and I could just say, well, what's the pressure right here? And you can go solve for the pressure by using Bernoulli. And the nice thing is because we've got an easy spot, you know, this point one, where we know the total energy could be expressed as five meters, I could just say, well, what's going on right here? Five meters equals, and then just give this right this right hand side of the equation, and boom, and then solve for it. Okay. Now it might be a little hard sometimes. Sometimes you might have to do it at another spot in order to get the velocity first. You know, like you might say, well, I know more about what's going on at four, so I'll get the velocity. But I know the velocity at four is the same as the velocity at three, or at this point, because the diameter of the pipe is the same between these two. Okay, the flow rate is the same, the diameter is the same, so the velocity has to be the same. Okay, I didn't put that square right there, did I? Okay. So um, anyway, that's the idea. Okay, let's see if I can find uh, another one. I don't think that's the A part to this problem. Oh, okay, so the B part is determine the maximum elevation of the highest point of the piping system. I'll, I'll let you work that one. Um, basically do the same thing again, except we're solving for Z instead. Um, you know, um, all right, let's, um, let's find another one. Okay. Um, I mean, I know the type that I want to do. Um, where are you, my friend? That one. Is it? Sorry about this. Okay, um, we could do this. All right, so let's do the last one, number 15. Um, let me clear all drawings. Okay, and um, I don't think this one's terribly difficult, but you know, like all of them, they have some nice they all have nice things that they illustrate. Okay, so here's a tank. And it's got a little hose coming out of the bottom. The nozzle. 
I don't know if they care about the nozzle in this case, but they have the nozzle. And then up here, this is two atmospheres. This is Z1. Okay, so Z1, the water level in the tank Z1 is 15 meter, meters above the ground. Okay, so this equals 15 meters. A hose connected to the bottom of the tank and the nozzle at the end of the hose is pointed straight up. Tank covers airtight and the air pressure above the water surface is two atmosphere gauge. Okay, G. The system is at sea level. Okay, determine the maximum height to which the water stream could rise. Thanks, take the density of water to be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, um, so this is kind of an interesting um, problem. Um, at least <laughs> what I think is interesting about this anyway. So the water is gonna, so here's our water surface. The water is gonna shoot up and at some point in time, it's gonna kind of, kind of run out of energy. Um, and what's interesting here, and I don't think this is technically correct, but a lot of times, and probably this is the way the book is gonna do this, is you know, this is a good place to pick, well, we're gonna use Bernoulli here. Um, and here's our streamline, basically any line going through here from here all the way down here. Now, I think that what, what is typical here is we pick point one right here because we know all the information there. P, P, Z, and V are all easy right there. And then what, we, what they're gonna do, what they do a lot is they wanna pick the velocity two right here. And uh, I don't think that that's technically correct. Some, you know, I kind of feel like as soon as this thing loses containment, the idea of a streamline is a little bit, is a little bit hazy to me, um, but it will work um, if you assume that there's no um, wind resistance. So if there's no wind, then basically this thing is just gonna keep going up in a stream and you're not gonna have these little bits kind of coming off to the side, okay? Which would cause you to lose an awful lot of energy. Okay, so I think, I think I guess if, if there's no wind resistance, then this is probably okay. Normally what I would suggest is what's more correct would be good to go from one to two here. And then it becomes a projectile problem from two, from red two to blue two. Um, you know, so you'd have to, you know, pull out your equations from, you know, um, you know, dynamics or whatever. Um, and ultimately that those equations would give you the exact same answer um, if you ignore wind resistance. But anyway, so we're going to go from blue one to blue two. And so P1 on gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared on 2G equals, again, we're picking, so this, we picked one because we have a lot of information info and we're picking two because that's where we want you know we're picking two because that's where we want our answer now we could pick a different two if we needed some something else like we might pick a different two if there was like well, we don't know enough information at the point that we want so we have to pick a different point and just in order to fill in the blanks okay so we're going to start by doing okay well what's the pressure at one well obviously it's not atmospheric it's actually uh, two atmosphere gauge, which means it's three absolute, three atmospheres absolute, um, but we're gonna work in gauge. Okay, so we're gonna say two atmospheres, which is, so an atmosphere is 101.325 um, kPa. So we'll just multiply that by two. So this is gonna be, um, well, let's see, how do we do this? Let's do like two ATM gauge. So that's gonna be, Two times one hundred one point three two five. Let's actually make that a let's make that a comma, because because I want to I want to work in pascals and not kilopascals. Okay, so I don't make that mistake. Okay, divided by gamma, which is ninety eight to ten newtons per meter cubed. And again, we got newton per meter squared divided by newtons per meter cubed, so that'll give us newtons. Okay, so um, our datum for z for our z's. We're gonna choose this thing to be the ground. Okay, so that's the datum. So we'll turn this into a, a 15 meters. So we'll add, oh, not red, add 15 meters. And then we'll get V1 squared over 2G. And again, we use that same like Tahoe assumption. This is a tank. So we're just gonna say, okay, well, cool. This goes away. Okay, and um, I call that like, 
tank or the Tahoe assumption or whatever. Okay, plus zero equals. And I'll pause for a second. And I'm just going to go ahead and get the values here because I like to I like to think in those terms. So two times 101, 325 divided by 9810 equals okay, 20 point six seven six five seven six five seven meters plus fifteen meters plus zero meters. So in this case, the uh, the pressure is the pressure in the tank is more important than the depth of the tank. Um, but they're both obviously very important. They're of the same order of magnitude. That's that's why I usually, I mean, obviously I can plug all those numbers into my calculator and get the full left-hand side in one move, but I like to stop and kind of think about orders of magnitude. What's, what's driving the flow here? In this case, it's being driven by both. Um, so, um, so this is what, 35.657 meters equals. Okay, and that's how much energy we have total on the right. Now I want to note that, um, well, we'll do this in a second, okay? So P2, what's the pressure at two? Well, should be atmospheric. Gauge pressure, atmospheric is zero. So we'll go ahead and get rid of that. Okay, so atmospheric, so that's zero because it's gauge. Z2 is what we're looking for. So I'll just put a question mark there. And then the V2 squared over 2G, well, that's the velocity at the very top. So that's when it stops going up. So the velocity there is zero. Okay, so this is, I'll, I'll just say it's because of the top. Okay, so this worked out pretty nice and easy. Z2, Z2, Z2. That's my answer. Okay, and again, it's nice because what we're learning here is that as the, um, you know, 15 meters of this is because of the depth of the tank. 20.6 or 20.7 meters of this is because it was pressured above, pressurized above the tank. So if you're like, well, I wanna figure out, like I want it to go another foot higher. Well, you could easily, easily just back up. Well, how much pre more pressure would I need? Well, I would need an extra P on gamma equal to say two more meters. If I wanted to go two more meters higher, or if I wanted five more meters, well, I could just you know say, well, that's how much more I would need in order to push this up and create another five over here. You know? So, I mean, I, I think there's a, kind of a real beauty to this equation, you know, it's, um, you know, at least in this, in this form, there's lots of forms of the equation. Um, a lot of them will have it in terms of pressures. There's a form that has it all in terms of energies. I like to think of it in terms of energies that for whatever reason we measure in units of, of length or head. So, um, that's just the way that I do it, but you know, to each their own. Um, anyway, let me find, so any questions on this? Let's see, it was, um, I wanna find basically the classic problem, my favorite problem. No, none of that. That is a version. Hmm, okay, let's go ahead and just, we'll just go ahead and do that one. I don't like dealing with gases when I can avoid it. So let's, <laughs> let's do number five. Um, I don't like reminding myself the ideal gas law. Um, okay. And we, we could just set this one up um, potentially. Okay, so air. So here's, here's the flow. Uh, let's, do, let's do that. Let's do the, the geometry in black. Because this will kind of get at the question that you had uh, earlier about um, the disease, and um, you know, like in the first problem where the disease just disappeared. Okay, so we've got this kind of this is a reducer, or um, this is often referred to as a venturi. And so what we do is we go like this, and this is definitely a good a good case for a. Um, ruler all right so we got some fluid in there which i hope they're going to tell us what that is this is h okay and this is the fluid all 
Okay, so this is going to be, um, this is air, and the air is going in this direction. We actually can't tell direction with Bernoulli, which is very strange. Um, but because there's no energy loss, it doesn't matter which way it goes. Okay, air at 105 kPa and 310 Kelvin flows upward through a 7.2 centimeter diameter inclined duct. So Q at 65 liters per second. The duct, um, let's see here, the duct diameter is then reduced to four centimeters through a reducer. So this is four centimeters. And this one right here is 7.2 centimeters. Okay, the pressure changes across the reducer measured by a water manometer. So that's good, this is water. Okay, the pressure on the front end is pressure equals 105 kPa. Three, temperature equals 310 Kelvin. Elevation, elevation difference between the two points in the pipe where the two arms of the manometer are attached is 0 0.20 meters. So they're saying that basically from here to here, the elevation difference between the two pipes, oh, I don't wanna go through there. Okay, so between here and here, 0 0.20 meters. Density of the water is 100, and the air, the constant, the ideal gas constant of air is R equals 0 0.287 kPa times cubic meters kilogram Kelvin. Okay. All right. So with these problems. You always, 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 always want to pick your points. Um, I actually don't like the way that I've drawn these points. I'm going to draw this point right here. Usually you, you go center of the pipe. And I'm actually going to assume that this point zero two zero goes to the center of the pipe. Because I don't, I don't really want to, yeah, this, I think this is just more, um, more typical. Okay, so this is point one and this is point two. Okay, and um, this point two O goes from one to the other. All right, now the reason that we pick these points and we will do this all the time is because these are the points where we have information. And this manometer only tells us information about basically things that are perpendicular to uh, the flow. So the flow kind of is going this way. So we can only draw a line going this way to use the hydro hydrostatic equation. You can only use the line here going perpendicular to the flow to use the hydrostatic equation. And we like center line, okay? Just because that makes life a lot easier. So, um, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do Bernoulli from one to two. And the way that I always do this is I set up Bernoulli as the master equation. And then on the side, I'm gonna start kind of figuring things out. So here's my Bernoulli and I'm gonna go P1 on gamma. And I just picked those points because I have information there. P1 on gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared on 2G equals P2 on gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared on 2G. And I don't know, we've got 10 minutes. I don't know if we'll be able to finish this completely, especially because we're gonna have to do the ideal gas law here because it's air. So, um, so we don't know what gamma is. So we're gonna work on that. Um, but what we're gonna do here is, is I'm gonna show you how we always, I mean, not always, but just about always get these terms. So the pressures, any idea where we're going to get the pressures? We only have one pressure given right there, the 105. Okay, we do in fact have one of the pressures given and we don't have pressure too. Um, but every time we work one of these, if there's a manometer, you get the pressures from the manometer. And what we're not, we're actually not going to solve usually for like what the actual pressure is. We're usually going to be able to solve for what the pressure difference is. Okay, so in this one, they give you a pressure. Um, I think that's because I'm um, 99% sure that's because this is a gas. And without, the, without knowing what the actual pressure is, you can't get that, that gamma. You can't get the density. So without knowing what an actual pressure is, you know, we can't do that. But, but so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and just tell you, like, if this were water flowing through that pipe or any other, if it was an incompressible liquid, um, 
it's actually weird that we're using this on a compressible liquid, but um, what uh, fluid, whatever. But these two, we're going to use the manometer. And I'm going to show you how we deal with that right now is that what I do is I write this as P2 minus P1 over gamma on the right hand side of the equation. Because that will come straight out of the manometer equation. Okay, Z1 and Z2. Okay, these just come from the geometry of the problem. So those are usually the easiest. You just look at it, you figure out where you, you want your datum is, and then you just, you know, that's these, this is the easiest one, and you just get that from the geometry. Okay, geometry. Okay, and then the last, let's see, I guess I'll use green here. V1 and V2, okay, we get those from continuity. And I'll go, I'm gonna go ahead and work all of those. Um, and what are we looking for in this problem? I assume we're looking for the flow rate, that's the usual. Oh, we're trying to find H. Okay, so we're find, trying to find, um, so this is given required, we want this lowercase h equals, you know, what does it equal? Okay. Um, all right, let's, um, maybe we should, <laughs> maybe we should get the, the density of the air. Um, let's just, let's just knock out the density of the air. Um, so in fluids class, if you, if you have to use the ideal gas law, this is the one that we typically use. Um, I don't particularly like doing the ideal gas law, but we use this one um, where that R is uh, gas specific. Okay. Um, I think, wait, rho. Yeah, yeah, it's, the R is uh, gas specific. Um, yeah, and that way, yeah. So we are used to like from high school or just chemistry class, you use the ideal gas law where there's an R that is like the universal gas constant. You could, you have, we just have a different one and we use this R that is, that is specific. So I, I don't like it when it's just called R. Um, I like if it says R air or something along those lines so that we can kind of keep this thing, you know, you know keep, our, keep things separate and moving, okay? So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, solve this. We, we need that density because it's gonna plug in right here and right here. So we need to figure out that density. So, um, so we know the pressure is um, 105,000 pascals equals rho, which is what we're looking for. The R of air is 0 0.287 kPa. And so we'll actually change that to 287 pascals times meters cubed per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, and now we need the temperature. Uh, which is 3101. I believe that was a Kelvin that I erased. Or th excuse me, 310 Kelvin. Okay, if we solve this, we'll get, um, let's see, uh, 105, 1, 2, 3, divided by 310, divided by 287 equals 1.1802. And the units, we got kelvins go away, pascals go away, flip to the other side, we get kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. And that, if I multiply it times gravity, so times 9.81, I'm going to get 11.5. I mean, I can say the rho, there's the gamma of air equals 11.577, 11.577 um, uh, newtons per meter cubed. Okay. Do you follow all that? I mean, that's pretty unusual in this class for me to do that. We usually work with liquids. Okay, so anyway, that was, that's a silly waste of time, a silly aside, not silly, but um, we didn't have much time. It was kind of a waste of time to do that. Um, all right, so let's, let's just go through these and I'm gonna kind of just get you kind of started. So, you know, if you see something like this. All right, Z1 and Z2. Okay, what we do here is you can make the datum whatever you want. All that matters is that Z2 is 0 0.20 meters higher than Z1, okay? You can't define Z downwards 
Like sometimes you're like, oh, I can do whatever I want. Well, if you do that, then the problem is that changes all your hydrostatic equations. Okay, so Z needs to be upwards, okay, away from the opposite of gravity. So in this case, basically what I, the way I usually think of it is I just make this my datum. So that makes, you know, I usually choose my lowest point to be my datum. So Z1 becomes zero and Z2 becomes 0 0.20. Okay, so I'll, I'll just kind of start entering numbers here, plus 0 0.20 meters. I guess I can put the gamma in if I wanted to, like right here, if I wanted to. I guess I'll just leave it as gamma air for now. Okay, V1 and V2. Okay, um, this one goes away because it's the datum. Okay, V1 and V2. What we do is we use a continuity equation between location one and location two. And so what I say is that the Q at one equals the Q at two. So I'll say uh, Q1. Um, let me find a good spot. Let's go right over here. Q1 equals Q2. So I'll say pi times um, diameter one squared over four equals pi times the diameter two squared over four. Okay, those pi's and those fours are going to cancel right out. Oh, wait, I forgot a velocity, sorry. <laughs> V1, V2. So what's nice here is I can usually say, um, let's see, I usually like to work in terms of the smaller velocity. You know? Yeah, the smaller velocity. So the smaller velocity is V1. So that means I'm going to solve for V2. So I'll say uh, V2 equals V1 times, now we're going to get, just have a ratio here of uh, D1 over D2 squared. You all right with that? Okay. So we can plug that in to, um, I could plug that in like right here. Okay. And so that gets rid of a variable because now instead of having V1 and V2, I've only got V, looks like I only have V1 because I know D1 and D2. Um, in this case, however, we wouldn't even do that, right? Because um, we actually know Q. So if I know Q, I can say, well, Q equals this, and I can solve for V1 and V2 right off the bat. But if I don't know Q, then we need to do what I just, what I just described. Okay, and then the pressures. So the way we get the pressures is we do a manometer equation from one to two. And so what I do is I say, okay, I'm gonna start at one. Let's see, let me get a nice, let's get green. Okay, I'm gonna start at one. I'm gonna say P1. And I'm gonna add, well, let's see, we're gonna go down whatever this distance is. Oh, that's a horrible line. Um, I'm gonna go down some distance here, which you can call it whatever you want. I'm gonna call it X because I don't feel like, thinking about it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down, plus this is the gamma of air times the distance I go down, which is gonna be X plus H. So that's gonna get me from down to there, and then it's gonna get me down to here. And then I'm gonna start coming back up, minus gamma water. So we go over here, that has no effect. And we're gonna go minus gamma water times H. And then I'm gonna go minus gamma air times the distance up to go all the way up to the top, which is going to be, let's see here, uh, X plus 0 0.2, 0 0.20 meters like that equals P2. Okay, so what I'll do then, and I do this, I do this every single problem. And if you look through my keys and, um, you know, whatever is I, I kind of do this again and again and again and again. Obviously, we're not going to solve this problem, but um, is what I do is I go, okay, I'm going to take P2 on, on my right. I'm going to subtract P1 from the left. And then I'm going to divide by the gamma of the fluid that I'm working with, gamma of air, the whole, the whole left-hand side. So what that does is that creates something that I can plug in right here. And so if I do equals, so... I've subtracted that from the left-hand side, divide this whole thing by gamma air, 
then I end up in this case, I'm ending with X plus H minus gamma water over gamma air times H minus X plus 0 0.20 meters like that. Okay. And so uh, these X's go away, thankfully, because we don't know what that is. Okay. And I end up with what? Um, H minus, or well, usually these equations end up with things like this. So usually the way this is written is uh, one minus gamma water over gamma air times H minus 0 0.20 meters equals P2 minus P1 over gamma air. Okay, and you take all of this, all of which is, well, in this case, it's not all known because we don't know H and we plug it in right there. Okay, that's a little, a little quick, but um, that's how I solve these problems again and again and again. Usually what you solve for in these is the V, because usually what happens is this is, a, this is a system that is designed to measure the velocity or measure the flow rate. And so what you do is you create a, a reducer and then you put in the manometer. And so it's a, it's a pretty standard thing. The problem that I gave you all to work on for this week looks exactly like this except it's not asking for H, it's asking for something else. So um, these are my favorite types of problems because you have to know an awful lot of fluids to do this problem. If you can do this problem, you're, you're in pretty good shape as far as fluids are concerned. Um, so anyway, any questions? No, I'm good. That was, that was really good. Okay, was that fairly logical? I mean, I know I kind of had to hurry there at the end, but. No, that, that all made sense. I, okay. I like all the algebra stuff, so that was that was good. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, you know, if you get stuck on working the homework this week, the you know the, the turn in problem, you know, come back and look at this, and it'll kind of help you guide. Okay, or obviously come to office hours. So, all right, Paul. All, all right, guess, thank uh, you. Done. All right, have a good day. All right, you too. All right, later. Bye. Let's see. Stop recording. Where is that? No, not that one. Stop recording, everybody. <laughs>